Good morning. I'm Darrell West, Vice President of Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution, and I would like to welcome you to this forum on criminal justice reform. And we are webcasting this event live, so a warm welcome to all of our viewers from around the country and also those of you who are watching it live on C-SPAN. So we will be archiving the uh, video for uh, this event, so you'll have an opportunity to view it later uh, if you would like at brookings.edu. We'd also welcome any questions or comments uh, that you have. Uh, we've set up a, a Twitter feed at hashtag CJ Reform. That's hashtag CJ Reform. So you're welcome to uh, post any comments uh, that you have during the forum. So the United States has one of the highest incarceration rates in the world. Our prisons are overcrowded, and there are racial disparities in convictions and sentencing. We need to reform our criminal justice system and develop alternatives to the existing policies. Today, we're going to be discussing criminal justice reform and how to approach that issue. To help us think about that subject, I am pleased to welcome Governor Terry McAuliffe to Brookings. Many of you know him as the governor of the Commonwealth and a lifelong entrepreneur. He was elected in 2013 and has worked to create jobs and build a 21st century economy. But he also is committed to bettering the lives of ordinary people. After the tragic violence at Charlottesville, he spoke out uh, uh, forcefully against hatred and bigotry. And just over the weekend, he hosted a family day at a juvenile correctional center, which brought together inmates and family members. He's been a trailblazer in restoring civil voting rights for those released from prison. And during his time in office, he has restored voting rights to thousands of ex-felons in Virginia. So please join me in welcoming Governor McAuliffe to the Brookings Institution. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be back at the Brookings Institution. Appreciate y'all coming out today. Uh, Daryl, I thank you for that introduction. We have some great panelists here with us today, and I appreciate all you're doing. So to all of you, good morning. It's a privilege to be among so many people who share my passion for such an important issue that faces our country. And it's fitting that we're gathered here today on the 54th anniversary of the March on Washington. I first want to recognize the four people who uh, have been very instrumental in working with me today. If they could stand up, my Secretary of Public Safety is here, Brian Moran. My Deputy Secretary, Victoria Cochran, Tracy DeShazer, who is here with us, who is from the Secretary of the Commonwealth. And my Secretary of the Commonwealth is coming, but I don't see her here yet. But uh, these folks have really done a job. Virginia has now led the nation on so many of these very important issues, and I do want to thank the team that we've assembled. One month ago, I may have given a very different speech. But today, I speak with you with a strengthened resolve of what we've seen over the past several weeks. For many of us, we found it disgusting, deplorable, not acceptable in this great country. We saw hatred, bigotry, and deeply rooted uh, racism on display in Charlottesville and across the nation. The grief and shock at the senseless deaths of Heather Heyer, a 32-year-old woman, who was out exercising her constitutional right and was killed by a terrorist driving a car. To the two state troopers in Virginia whom we lost, both individuals very close to me personally, Trooper Burke Bates had been part of my private security detail, my executive protection unit. Lieutenant Cohen had been the pilot of the helicopter that I've flown on for the last three and a half years. I can tell you folks, heartbreaking to go visit the families, to see Karen Cullen and her two children, to see Amanda Bates and go visit her at her home and to see her with her two children. Husband not coming home, father not coming home, and to the higher family who lost their daughter, our thoughts and condolences to all of them. Also, the swift and unequivocal outpouring of love and solidarity from the vast majority of our citizens. That unabashed and disgusting display that we saw of white supremacists and neo-Nazis and other protests that followed elsewhere was so shocking to so many of us. As I said in Charlottesville that Saturday night, there is no place for Nazis or white supremacists or Klansmen in Virginia. I said on that Saturday evening to get out, to leave our beautiful state, 
you were not wanted, to go home. Your hatred is not in Virginia. We don't want you in America. These people, as they paraded down our streets, pretended they were patriots. They are not patriots. They are cowards. Patriots are Virginians like Barbara Johns, a 16-year-old woman in Prince Edward County, Virginia, in the 50s, young African-American girl who walked out and took her class of 400 people and said, we will not come back until we have equal school facilities. Patriots are the young men and women who wear the cloth of our country to protect those basic freedoms and liberties that we enjoy so much. Charlottesville was a painful and vivid reminder that although we have made significant progress, we still have so much work to do. It is also forcing those whose privilege has allowed them to remain silent, to reconcile two different views of America. Let us be clear. This isn't a debate about monuments. These folks weren't just protesting the name of preserving Southern heritage. They want to maintain inequality in everything that they do, from criminal justice to education to housing, and they want to elevate racism to the highest form. So far, unfortunately, the pendulum has swung in their direction. African Americans, particularly men, are incarcerated at an alarming rate that is disproportionate. African American children are more likely to live and attend school in an area of concentrated poverty. At school, they're disproportionately disciplined and suspended. And they've been the target of legislatures around the country that have pursued policies intended to rob them of their most basic dignity and civic duty, the right to vote. It's no secret that Virginia has adopted and perpetuates some of those same policies and practices. We know that our history is far from perfect in Virginia. But that is exactly why I believe that Virginia should serve as an example to other states looking to take on reform. When I first became governor, it was clear that one place that badly needed attention and resources was our juvenile justice system. We were spending 40% of our funds on just 10% of the youth in our state correction system. And nearly 80% were rearrested within three years. To house just one juvenile, it cost Virginia $155,553 per year. And that does not include the educational services, which total $31,644 a year for a total of $187,000. And yet, 80% were rearrested within three years. I was proud to be the first Virginia governor to ever visit one of our juvenile facilities. And in fact, I've now visited both. I had the opportunity to speak with a group of teenage boys at one of Virginia's oversized, maximum security, adult-style facilities. The group asked me, why is it, Governor, that the recidivism rate is so high? In fact, the longer that they stayed incarcerated, the more likely they were to reoffend. These boys knew as well as I did that the system was clearly working against them instead of working for them. So I decided to close down both of these outdated institutions and replace them with smaller community-based centers that focus on therapy, training, and education. Today, I am proud to say that our population of incarcerated youth has been cut now by two-thirds, from nearly 600 to just over 200 today. I've directed the millions in savings from this declining institutional population to be reinvested, to support the new centers and create an effective statewide system of evidence-based services and supports aimed at preventing incarceration in the first place. To date, I'm proud to say that we have not found any other state that has been able to replicate what we've been able to do in Virginia. I'm proud that we have secured funding, that we now offer free travel to families to visit their children. With the new regional options, 
75% of our youth will now live within an hour's drive of their family. Today, unfortunately, that number is only 25%. All of these steps will help us strike the right balance between public safety, cost effectiveness, and rehabilitation. And they support our ultimate goal of giving these kids a shot at a better life when they leave. Just yesterday, as Darrell mentioned, I visited the Bon Air Juvenile Correction Center, one that I'm closing, just outside of Richmond for a family day festival. It was a day for them to celebrate with their families the progress and success that they have had and to just give them just a couple hours to feel like a regular kid. I was amazed by their incredible talent. One group even performed a spot-on rendition of songs from Hamilton. And we heard moving stories from former, former incarcerated youth who are now finding tremendous success in their new lives because of the new tools that we've been able to provide them. I met a young man named Jalen who had recently been released from the facility where he had spent the last five years of his life. But while some people might see a troubled youth, I saw someone who has the respect and admiration of his peers and his mentors. Jalen is an avid reader and a poet. While incarcerated, he was a mentor at the University of Virginia-led Russia Literature Program and served as the president of the Bon Air Student Association. And now, with 24 college credits already under his belt, he walked out of Bon Air last month with a college acceptance letter in his hand. That's exceptional. <clears throat> because when I became governor, there were no college courses available to them. Today, these youths are taking up to seven college courses, including earning their high school diplomas or GEDs and getting now workforce credentials. This marks the first time in Virginia history that such robust educational offerings have been made. That speaks to our dedicated team at the Department of Juvenile Justice and the great educators who work with these youths. While Jalen's story is inspiring, he isn't alone. I believe that each of these young men and women deserve a chance to succeed when they leave the confines of juvenile detention. For our juvenile justice agency, that work starts the moment that they enter our care. But for our education department, for example, that work starts much earlier. Like many states, far too many of our Virginia students spend time outside the classroom as a result of disciplinary action. We've heard of stories of students being handcuffed and arrested, and the data clearly shows that African-American children and students with disabilities are disciplined at a much higher rate. And according to the Virginia Department of Education, African-American students make up 24% of the student population, and yet they account for 53% of the school discipline. And while recent data show a decline in the overall number of suspensions and expulsions, these numbers, folks, are still far too high and continue to disproportionately impact certain students. Totally unacceptable. There is no room in the Commonwealth of Virginia for excessive discriminatory treatment of our students. That is why I announced in October of 2015 a major new statewide initiative, classrooms, not courtrooms. It is why I directed my children's cabinet to reduce the number of students who are referred to law enforcement experiencing unnecessary school suspensions and expulsions and suffering under disproportionate disciplinary practices. As a result, our agencies have been hard at work to support the local efforts to stop this practice. In June, we unveiled a new model memorandum of understanding for all of our local partners that all had to sign. And we now have a new rewritten Virginia School Law Enforcement Partnership Guide. There are very strict guidelines now when, when someone can be disciplined. And I recently signed legislation directing the Virginia Board of Education to establish new alternatives to short-term and long-term suspensions. Together, these steps will contribute to a healthier and more productive learning environment for all of our children, and I hope it will help prevent our young people from entering 
the juvenile justice system in, in the first place. These community-focused efforts aren't just important for early intervention and prevention. They are also critical to adults who are re-entering society after they have gone through a period of incarceration. Having a sense of community is critical to making this transition a successful one. We all know that. Just as important, our adult re-entry population needs the skills and preparation to be successful in today's economy. In Virginia, we have taken steps now to offer college credit coursework and career and technical training in all of our facilities. This prepares them for a smooth transition into the new Virginia economy that we've all worked so hard to build. We're proud to have one of the highest numbers of GEDs now among adults in correction facilities, and I am very proud over the last three years because of these efforts. Today, Virginia can boast the lowest recidivism rate of any state in the United States of America. <laughs> These measures point to the success of the historic transformation underway in Virginia, but we cannot stop there. As I alluded to earlier, insidious policies to hamper our citizens, including the lifelong label as a criminal in the name of public safety and justice, the burden of that label can be life-altering after you've served your time. To learn more about that firsthand, I invited four Virginians to have dinner with me last week at the governor's mansion. They were students, faith leaders, and professionals. They came from every walk of life. Each had their own unique pathway to success today. But the one common thread among them was their wish not to be defined by a mistake that they had made so many years earlier. That's because each of these Virginians had been convicted of a crime and had all had received a pardon from me. While most had long since moved on from their mistakes that they'd made, one of my guests hadn't even made a mistake in the first place. His name was Robert Paul Davis. And when he was 18 years old, he was wrongly convicted of a double murder after being forced to confess to a crime that he did not commit. On the day I signed his pardon, I ordered his immediate release from prison. He had spent 13 years of his life behind bars. In fact, I've pardoned many in Virginians who have never should have been charged in the first place. In May of 2015, I, gra I granted an absolute pardon to 58-year-old Michael McAllister, who had been wrongly convicted of attempted rape and abduction of a young mother in Richmond in 1986. After more than 28 years in prison, he was finally exonerated as a true criminal. A serial rapist who bore an uncanny resemblance to Michael came forward and confessed his role. And in March, I just pardoned a group of men known as the Norfolk Four, these four Navy veterans were wrongly convicted of raping and murdering a young woman in Norfolk in 1997. Together, they spent years in prison for a crime that they did not commit after being coerced into falsely admitting guilt by the lead Norfolk police detective on the case. Today, that police investigator is in prison for extortion and lying to the FBI about investigations. Sadly, this decades-long process has irrevocably changed the lives of these four men. I cannot give them back those years of their lives. Our system of justice is clearly an imperfect one, which makes the duty and authority to pardon such an important one. But it's not just for people who are wrongly convicted. Also at my dinner with me last week was a 64-year-old reverend, an Army veteran, who unfortunately had been hurt while he was in Vietnam, severely, became addicted to drugs, came home and at 23 years old was convicted of marijuana conviction in possession. That 40-year-old felony conviction followed him until the day he received a pardon from me. It had always bothered him and prevented him from getting certain jobs. Through my pardon power, I made sure that they knew that the Commonwealth of Virginia would never, ever again define these individuals as criminals. 
while executive clemency is an important power and responsibility of any governor, I've actually taken it to the next step. I've also taken executive action to ban the criminal background check on state job applications, and I've fought to end the ridiculous policy where in Virginia we would strip your driver's license for people who could not pay their court fines and fees. Now, you got court fines and fees, so you take the driver's license away so they can't drive to work to make money to pay the court fines and fees off. Is that not ridiculous? I found this one so baffling. And I reminded our legislators that, you know, there is no metro system in Martinsville, Virginia, or Abington. In our rural communities where this is very prevalent, the only way they can get to work is to drive. So this year, after a long concerted effort, I'm proud that I signed six bills that now makes it much more difficult for our courts to suspend driver's licenses and to give drivers a lot more options to get their driver's license back if it is suspended because of an unpaid court fine. In addition, as governor, I've also led the fight these past several years to raise the minimum felony threshold level. I'm embarrassed to say this, but today in Virginia, if you are convicted of stealing anything worth $200 or more, you are now a felon in Virginia for life. If $200 seems low to you, that's because it is. Virginia now ranks 50th out of 50 states, tied with New Jersey. <laughs> I'll leave that there. <laughs> Think about it. The $200 floor was first set in 1980, 40 years ago. It means that a kid who just turned 18 steals a pair of Air Jordans or takes an iPhone is now a felon in Virginia. And that label will be with that individual for the rest of his or her life. You should know that in 1985, it would have been a misdemeanor. So in 2016, I called for raising the minimum felony threshold to $500. Unfortunately, that never even made it out of committee. But if you know anything about me, I was not deterred. So we went back at this year's legislative session. And I proposed this modest increase again from $200 to $500. Just to keep up with inflation, that's where it would be. Unfortunately, it was rejected again. Just yesterday, I signed a pardon for a 47-year-old man. His name was Paul, who at 24 stole cash, more than $200, from the cash register at the department store where he worked. He had a new baby. He had a broken-down car, and he had no money. Today, he owns a thriving plumbing business, but his felony conviction sometimes prevents him from doing business on any military basis. At Christmas time, he donates free plumbing supplies and services for families in need. Paul was wrong to steal that money, of course, but it doesn't mean that a mistake that he made nearly 25 years ago should follow him forever. In Virginia, that felony conviction also permanently strips you of your civil and voting rights for life, unless restored by a governor. That draconian process was the basis for the most contentious battle I have had as governor. When I came into office, 40 states automatically restored these rights to former felons and gave them an opportunity to have a meaningful second chance with their lives. I set out to bring Virginia into line with the rest of the country. In April 2014, just three months after I took office, we made some changes. We shortened the request form from 13 pages to one, got rid of the notary public, got rid of the waiting period. We streamlined the process so that everybody had the same eligibility requirements. Later, in December 2014, I announced that I had restored the rights of 5,100 Virginians, more than any other governor of Virginia history had done in a year. We systematically removed burdensome requirements and ended the practice of withholding these rights simply because of outstanding court costs. In June of 2015, I was proud that I had restored more voting and civil rights than any governor in the history of the Commonwealth of Virginia. But for me, 
That was not enough. So on April 22nd, 2016, I stood on the steps of the Virginia State Capitol, which was designed in 1785 by Thomas Jefferson, and I issued an executive order to restore the rights of all Virginians who would served their time and had completed any supervision. That day, more than 200,000 Virginians earned back their right to vote. It was my proudest day as governor. We must ensure the rights of every citizen, which must also include those among us who have made mistakes, serve their time, return to our communities to make the most of their second chance. Unfortunately, when they do get out, their criminal record follows them as they look for work and housing, which are the basic necessities to help you have a second chance. And in Virginia, it's a mistake that stays with them even when they try to partake in democracy by voting. And there's a reason why, folks. 115 years ago, a felon disenfranchisement, a poll tax, and a literacy test were written into Virginia's Constitution. It is ironic that in this great country, with our imperfect history, we would punish those who've made a bad decision for the rest of their lives. Where would we be as a country if we were only judged by our mistakes? Why then do we judge and perpetually punish our fellow citizens who maybe got lost along the way? I've always said, <laughs> you show me someone who's never made a mistake, and I'll show you a liar. These are the questions that I've asked myself as I've traveled around Virginia and heard story after story from people who'd been denied their basic rights for years, and some of them have never been able to vote in a single election. There was a reason why this happened. That 115 years ago, a state senator by the name of Glass put these into our Constitution. Stood exactly where I stood 115 years ago, and to quote him precisely, we are doing this, quote, to eliminate the darky from being a political force in Virginia. Think about that for a second, folks. So on that April day, I was proud to restore the rights to folks like Terry Garrett, who'd been stripped of her rights after years of substance abuse and frequent incarcerations. Terry made mistakes, she served her time, she turned her life around. In addition to being a loving mother and grandmother, is now a respected community leader and a sponsor to recovering addicts and former offenders. Yet, as you know, Terry had remained a second-class citizen. Before that day in April of last year, this mother and grandmother did not have the right to vote, even though she had turned her life around and used her second chance to help others in need, especially those facing addiction. It was a sad legacy for the Commonwealth of Virginia. This policy was among the many Jim Crow era voter intimidation tactics that have been used to block people of color from voting ever again. As governor, I could not accept this grave injustice. But like so many other paths to justice, ours was not without obstacles. Virginia's Republican legislature sued me the day I took that action, arguing that I did not have the authority to do a blanket restoration. On July 22nd, the Virginia Supreme Court ruled against us, not based on constitutional grounds, but because they, quote, no governor had ever done this before. Now, I'll be very frank with you folks. I went to Georgetown Law School. I went full-time day. While I was there, I ran three companies. I wasn't in the building much. But even with my limited legal knowledge, <laughs> I knew I had the authority to do this. <laughs> I think the statute of limitations is passed on uh, how much time you're supposed to spend in law school. So think about this. Terry got her rights back, overjoyed. And here the Virginia Supreme Court had ruled against us, and she lost her right to vote again. I talked to her on that day. She was devastated. She couldn't talk. However, we weren't done fighting. On August 22, 2016, I stood in front of Virginia's historic Civil Rights Monument 
and initiated the new process of restoring rights. They had told me if the governor's going to do it, he has to sign every single one individually. I said, line them up. I'll sign every one individually if that's what it takes. So guess what happened? They didn't like that. Once again, I was sued. This time, the General Assembly Republicans sued me for contempt of court. I now have the honor of being the first Virginia governor to be sued for contempt of court. This time, the Virginia Supreme Court sided in my favor and said he's doing it right by doing it individually, and Terry Garrett got her rights back again that day. And in November of last year, for the first time in her life, she walked into a voting booth to cast her ballot. With that vote, she officially regained her place in our society and showed us how powerful a second chance can be. Terry fulfilled this hard-fought civic duty with pride, something that nearly 100 million eligible Americans did not exercise last November. Earlier this year, I invited Terry to join me for my annual State of the Commonwealth Address to the Virginia General Assembly in our historic capital. Terry stood in the balcony with tears streaming down her face as I honored her in a room with the very same people who had thought she was a second-class citizen and actually sued me to keep it that way. Over the past years, I've met countless people whose rights I've restored just like hers. These are our family, they're our friends, they are our neighbors. They send their children and grandchildren to our schools. They attend our churches and they pay taxes. And now they can once again have a say in how their communities will grow. This is not just a Virginia problem. Nearly six million Americans with felonies around the country today cannot vote. Think about that, six million Americans. These are people just like Terry, who've served their time and are ready for a second chance, only to be shut out from their community, the community that they contribute to. When people return to their communities after being incarcerated, we want them and we need them to make the most of their second chance. Progress is rarely easy, and I knew this would be the start of a hard-fought battle, but clearly one worth fighting. As I look back on the past year and a half, I'm proud of the remarkable accomplishments that we've achieved because we never gave up on that fight. We stood up to take action that will become a hallmark of significance in the history of civil rights. And today, because of this work, I'm proud to stand here and say that we've restored the rights of more than 161,000 Virginians who had deserved a second chance. I now have the honor of restoring more rights than any governor in the history of the United States of America. <laughs> Our work must continue until every person is ensured their basic human and basic civil rights. No voter should ever be barred from fulfilling their civic duty. No person should ever fall through the cracks of a broken criminal justice system. No child should be subjected to failing schools simply because of their family's economic status. Our efforts to date have started a long overdue conversation about how we view justice and how we can live up to our own American ideals. But we cannot continue that conversation without acknowledging how we got here in the first place. So yes, let's tear down those monuments and put them in the museums, in the battlefields, in the cemeteries where they truly belong. But let us also tear down the insidious policies that keep inequality and racism alive in our institution and in our attitudes. The greatest monuments that we can build to our nation's core values are not made of stone. We must actually live the American legacy that we all seek to honor by ensuring that every single child in this country has an equal shot to succeed, that every single man and woman who's made a mistake has a second chance to make it right, and that every American has a place to call home. That's what we've worked hard to do in Virginia under my watch. The progress that we've seen is just the start of a transformation that could take generations to be fully realized. That's why I hope this important work continues in January under my successor, because this isn't a Democrat or a Republican idea. It's an issue that cuts across economic status, race, origin, 
age, and political party. Incarceration and disenfranchisement have torn apart far too many families for far too long. And they've been used as legal tools to suppress the political and economic rise of our African-American friends and neighbors. Folks, it's past time for criminal justice reform. It is time for a criminal justice revolution. Thank you very much.